Alrighty, guys. Welcome everybody to another episode of a movie battleground. This is part of the uh, the contenders tournament thing, blah blah, whatever whatever you call it. I am your host of Black Lantern Brooklyn Dale. Not your usual host, but I was called in to uh, to judge to help judge this debate. Uh, we have Cody Newberry taking on uh, one Cobra slash Titan slash whatever you want to call him. Chance Ellison. He has decided to uh, come back down with move out of ground uh, for for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, but before we get to our competitors, we're gonna in, we're gonna introduce and talk to our judges today. Uh, first of all, joining me today, we just recorded a fantastic nerdgasm match with him him competing. Uh, that would be one Ryan the Hunter Permison. Ryan, how are we doing today? And how do you feel about Cody taking on Chance? I'm doing well, good sir. Thanks for having me. This ought to be a really really good match, Cody. Uh... Cody knows his way around uh, debating, and Chance we call him the Cobra and the next uh, champion for a reason. So he's got his uh, he's got his skills. Cody's got his, but uh, this is going to be a very very good competitive match. I look forward to seeing how it goes. Yeah. All right, and uh, my other my, the other judge joining us today. You can find him on Multiplex running fandom fights, as well as being a third judge on Nerdgasm uh, as a league that he once used to run and compete in. Uh, that would be one Caleb Coho. Caleb, how are we doing today, and how do you feel about Cody versus Chance? Uh, I feel very good sitting here, uh, sitting on the ones and twos and uh, making sure everything runs smoothly uh, on the camera side. Um, but yeah, this is going to be fun. Um, Cody's uh, proven himself as a multiple time debate champion in multiple debate areas. Uh, Chance has shown he knows his trivia and he's shown that he knows his way through a debate. Uh, so it's going to be very, uh, very interesting and very close to see these two fight today. Uh, yes. All right. Let's get into some pre-game interviews. Uh, I'm going to start off with Chance Ellison. Chance, what are you doing here? Like, you're probably like a phone call away from Dan Merle being like, oh, yeah, get me on movie fights. So we get you, get you, you can go, you could easily be on movie fights. Why, why are you down here hanging out with us commoners? Uh, Cody needed a match. They, they had some big things they wanted to pull off. And they need someone with a uh, higher rank to do it, and I had that higher ranking, and I was allowed to do like debate stuff. So I thought, you know, it's been a while since I've done this, so why not? Yeah. Uh, are you worried about any of the uh, any of the fan rust? You don't, you know, there's no longer the uh, you no longer have the lights to, to look down on you. It's literally just five white guys in a webcam. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not I'm a little bit that I haven't debated a thing in a while except for when i tell ryan or caleb their opinion sucks but uh you know i've seen cody debate a lot i was actually i got a chance to debate cody's speed round on late night with take three then so uh you know i i know the dude is a classically trained debater but i'm happy i'm happy to take him up so this is gonna be fun well uh best of luck to you sir you are going to need it as you're going up against a loud mouth cody newberry Cody, somehow you are the jukebox dance-off champion. You are somehow the confidential <laughs> cinema champion. Uh, although I was unable to judge that one, so I'm sure uh, I'm sure you pulled you pulled some strings over there. Um, you're going up against Chance. You've debated him before in uh, in the speed round format. I'll play that with take three, but now you have uh, now you have some prep some prep questions. Uh, how was uh, how was it trying to prepare for Chance? Um, I put Chance and Henry almost on the same level. I have a lot of respect for both of them. They know a lot about movie knowledge. Um, so I don't take anybody to go into debate as an easy task. I just map out my argument and see where it stands. Um, Chance is very good. Um, and he's very once uh, once he gets an edge in a fight, he's very good at throwing the jabs. So you have to be mindful of that. Um, but yeah. Uh, I was excited. Uh, again, this was going to be a gauntlet style match originally. Thank gosh that's not what we're doing anymore because three starting matches would have been impossible for me. But a little bit of break. I think these questions are really good. And I kind of gave Chance an edge. I let him uh, keep a pitch question, which I absolutely hate. So this should be very interesting in the match. There's absolutely nothing wrong with pitch questions. They're actually one of my they're they're my personal favorites. Uh, but let's get right into the rules and stipulations. Uh, these guys are given three prep questions. They submitted their answers accordingly. Uh, took time to study. Should they should they choose to? Um, and they're going to have uh, a one minute opening, followed by a five minute free form, followed by a one minute closing. Uh, rules and regulations for me i guess no filibustering uh my uh, my general rule and anything don't be a dickhead 
Uh, and there is also the the move battleground uh, thing of a one minute extension. If you want, if you want a little more time on on those on those prep questions, uh, you do have that option. Uh, this will be the first two three points, as there are three prep and two speed round questions. So, uh, first question was was the pitch question that Cody is so adamantly against. Um, with Liam Neeson's recent uh, recent take on action movies often being uh, centered around vehicle transportation, we asked the competitors to pitch a Liam Neeson movie uh, that is centered around some form of transportation. Uh, so, Chance, uh, you are going to be going first. You got one minute. Time begins whenever you start talking. Hey, this is the one I insisted uh, we keep when uh, we were debating this because I, I do like pitching. So. Uh, I am essentially pitching the third installment of the Liam Neeson mass transit ass kicking trilogy. Uh, this movie is going to be set on a ferry. So yeah, it's a ferry that you take to work or take to different parts of you know islands. I imagine the movie's going to set, be set in Manhattan because it's the only place you know having. Uh, so, anyways, uh, Liam Neeson is going to be look. It's not like a lot of these movies because you know you look at like Nonstop or um, The Commuter, the one the, the Liam Neeson. It, it's traditionally it's Liam Neeson's on a mode transportation. And beats and has to beat everyone up until he finds who he's looking for. Uh, usually has some kind of set of skills. Here he hasn't had that. Here he is literally just a normal dude, and he's an average guy. He doesn't have any special skills. He is just and to, to you know kind of deviate from what he usually does. He's someone who he's not. He's not conversational. He's a little squirrely. He's you know someone who like really needs to build up to be kind of a hero. And that's when his ferry gets hijacked by a paramilitary unit led by a man played by Sterling K. Brown, who was a great actor and who should be more stuff. Uh, you know, they you know, they are looking for a certain target, but they confuse Neeson with that target. So it's a cat and mouse game and also the game of mistaken identity. And Liam Neeson has to kind of bone up and be the hero of this story. So I, mean, I think, you know, for someone Liam Neeson who's who's in his sixties, it's gonna be a nice change of pace to, you know, see him take on a role like this in an action movie like this. And, uh, you know, I'll say uh, Paul Greengrass to direct, because I think he can do uh, tension. He demonstrated with the Bourne film that he can really do action effectively. So, yeah, that's my pitch. All right. Uh, interesting opening. Uh, Cody, you have uh, a, 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 a certain a lot of amount of time uh, to to pitch your, your at least <laughs> Liam Neeson uh, transportation movie. So Liam Neeson is known as the action guy. That's basically what he's known for in um, different travel. So what I want to do is a cruise ship. But I have this no tie to take in. This is no tie to anything. This is an individual story. He is just on vacation, relaxing from a business trip on a cruise ship. And then uh, it gets taken over. It's a wealthy cruise ship. These are all wealthy business people. They're on like kind of a retreat going a, on a long cruise. And it gets taken over by a gang led by J.K. Simmons. Um, so uh, Liam Neeson doesn't – I'm kind of with chance on this. I don't want the guy that – he gets a phone call. He has a select set of skills, and here he goes to take people out. I just – that's not entertaining. But he has to get that – I mean, chance are almost on the same ability here. Where we, he has to – he has to get the courage to take these people out little by little as it goes to end up saving his fellow co-workers and himself and uh, get everybody to safety pretty much. Um, I think this movie can be directed. Uh, I went with uh, Matt Reeves. I think Matt Reeves does a great, great job with like action and storytelling. So I think with Matt Reeves telling the story of Liam Neeson and I think like the you have those great scenes with like the intercom battle between J.K. Simmons because J.K. Simmons is one of those actors that I want to see in a lot more movies besides side characters. I want him to be actually be a lead, and I think a villain is perfect for him. And him and Liam Neeson having to square off at the end, I think, would be a beautiful thing. My movie is called Rough Travel, and it hits theaters May 2020. <laughs> Rough Travel. Already oh, giving us a point. giving us a title and a release date. Um, We'll see if that actually pays off. Uh, you guys get five minutes of free form. I'm just going to give you a one minute warning. Uh, so just whenever I say that, keep going. But I will count you down ten to one. So when time is up, time is up. There's no uh, no extra time here unless you guys want the one minute extension for uh, for this. I'm good. All right, cool. Five minutes. Let's get it on. 
Okay, so what I will say about Cody's because our the thing the difficult thing about this fight is our pitches are like you said very similar. Uh, I think mine has more like espionage, like thriller intrigue, where yours is just yours is more of a straight die hard on a boat scenario, which isn't a bad thing. The thing about it though, a cruise ship is not an interesting place to set a movie. Why? Because everybody is either over sixty, drunk, or a child. Like that's not. Like the, it's gonna feel like the stakes in that scenario are gonna be a little lessened just because you know there's nothing. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like he's in an average setting. It feels like he's gonna be in life's like one giant party the, the entire time. And you're talking. Okay, sorry, but my whole viewpoint is a cruise ship is large enough that you can have different things take over. Plus, this is a business trip, so like a bunch of people are on this that are not sixty or children or drunks. Some more. Tommy at the bar is a little hammered. No, no who, scenes, who takes a business? Who takes a business trip on a cruise ship? They're rich. No one takes it a doesn't business matter. trip. Who? My problem is you picked a ferry. Name the last giant yeah. ferry you've seen that somebody is like you can't find the battle on. Like Liam Neeson doesn't have a chance to like build up any courage because he's about three car lengths away from getting shot in the face by the people. He doesn't if he's not a guy that can take what people down. It, what if you said it in a place like uh like like look at this look at the ferry in Spider Man Homecoming. That was that was pretty sizable. That's a pretty sizable oh. boat. I think you you could set an action movie on okay, something like that. The, I think the, the whole the whole is, closed quarters sorry, so go ahead. I think the main problem with yours is there's not enough space to do a full action movie i know there'll be square downs and probably talk arounds and that's kind of neat for you but the problem is when people go in for a lisa lee and neeson movie in they want action but i want an actual good action i don't want like these stupid action movies anymore and the problem with yours is i don't think there's going to be enough people on the ferry to make it interesting or make it believable that he has to stand up why wouldn't they just shoot him in the face like if they're a lot a lot ferry, of people a lot of people take ferries on various days. And yeah, ferries are it's not like they're like these tiny things. Ferries are actually pretty big. Uh, and the thing is, like, I think the whole like close quarters feel, the whole like claustrophobic thing would actually enhance, would enhance the thing, enhance the film because you know, like around every corner, a potential threat could be. You know, like one false move could get you caught. It's gonna you know amp up the suspense of every single action sequence. Yo, yours, I mean, Liam needs to get distracted by the three girls who are on a who are on a girls' cruise going to going to the Bahamas while he's trying to solve this whole case. And also, I mean, J.K. Simmons is he's he's fine as a choice for a villain. There, there are other people I would rather see Liam Neeson go up against. And I think I think in that kind of role, it'd be good like an up and coming like younger actor to take to take on a villain role in. Not J.K. Listen, Simmons, who we've seen listen, do just about everything. You, and you know, for instance, you picked Sterling K. Brown, which plays the awkward, shy, nervous guy. I don't believe – I wouldn't buy for a fact that he'd be able to take over and lead a thing. Well, there was a little movie called Predator, and he was one of the worst pieces of that movie. And that's saying something with Predator. Oh, that, that, that's complete, <laughs> a complete falsehood. He's one of the best parts of that Predator. And oh, even, well, even aside from that, he, the, dude, the, dude has, the dude has plenty of range. I mean, you look at, like, Black Panther. You look at, like, Hotel Artemis. The dude has a commanding presence. He, he could totally – be like this yeah, like big militant guy. the whole thing in a giant on a ferry. And the problem is, it's not actually going to be Liam Neeson that takes control of this entire thing. The police can show up, like, because it's in a city. It's in the. It's in a. It's just in a cross path. There's a bunch of cops in the cruise ship in the middle of the ocean. It's going to be a while for somebody to go. So Liam Neeson has to make those split decisions and has to take those over. That's why it's intriguing. I don't care if there's drunk. Well, I mean, suspension, that's where special disbelief is going to come in because that's where special disbelief is going to come in because they're going to be like, hey, we, we, got all the, we got all these hostages. So, you know, you come on this boat, we will shoot everybody on. So that's, that's not really a hard, Liam Neeson, not really a hard you, fix. You can't really, subs you can't really subtract that with him anymore because he's always crazy. It's always these stupid, non-realistic action movies, and that's just another one. This is actually one. You said Die Hard, which I honestly don't think is a bad thing. I think, Liam, left. Left. I think Liam Neeson really has not. a perfect chance to revitalize or like do an action movie of that genre of the 90s, of the 80s, that are so remember and i think jk simmons has that perfect moment because literally when jk simmons a movie a show called oz on hbo literally one of the meanest m motherfuckers of all time he shows that he gives no f's and he literally uh i think that would be the perfect villain instead of playing a side character like he plays it everything i want him to get like from whiplash i wanted him to have that dominant performance against him and liam Neeson. yeah but like that's the thing i've seen i've seen the performance <laughs> i've seen every season of oz i've seen whiplash i've seen jk simmons do that role 
countless times. So it's not really a mistake. Give give a shot to a younger actor. And as far as like, this is something I think that's that's very different than what he's like. Like we've we've seen countless Die Hard ripoffs. Like this is something. I mean, it's on the spectrum, but it's not exactly like carbon copy, which I think is something. Look, Liam Neeson makes an action movie at least every year, so Time. you need something. All right, guys, that is the that is the five minutes there. Uh, do thank you for stopping on the a lot of time. Uh, we now move into some closing arguments. Cody, we're going to start with you first. You have uh, up to a minute. Try to keep it concise. Wrap up your arguments and present the judges accordingly. I think Rough Travel is going to be the perfect movie to have uh, action sequences between Liam Neeson that you ha- don't have to do a million cutscenes. It has to be that psychological battle forth between J.K. Simmons taking people over on the ship that he's got to actually rise up. He doesn't have those select skills, so he has to actually use the environment, take people out, battle through his way, get J.K. Sim- JK Simmons pissed off. I just think that oh, what Chance Pitts, regardless that he doesn't have the skills... It's the commuter. It's nonstop. It's a guy on a plane. It's a guy on a ferry that has to battle against certain people. Sterling K. Brown's going to be there, which I don't think is going to be that thing. And I think the problem is the entire pitch was the problem of the mode of transportation. The ferry is not that interesting. You have to subtract a lot of disbelief on that to believe that this is a battle that can't be stopped by a lot of different things. Uh, in a cruise ship, it's isolated. It's away. This is JK versus Liam on the boat with, uh, with guns and having to take people out and save his crew. And I think it's a perfect action movie to bring him back to prominence without having to be the goofy action person that we have come to know him from Taken. All right. We're first. Uh, Chance, uh, your closing arguments. You got about a minute. Uh, let's wrap up your arguments okay. and good attention. Okay. The reason I picked the ferry is because, you know, as opposed to a cruise ship, a ferry are going to get more, uh, more of the everyday people, more of the, you know, the common man, the, the working class, which is why this one, it's going to feel more relatable, going to feel more grounded in reality. And I, I think I think the size is a fair argument, is not a fair argument because, like, ferries are actually very, can be very sizable. I mean, a lot of people have to ride those day to day. And we've seen that movie. That's one. That's that one. This, this is different enough to stand on its own. And granted, I don't have a title yet. And also, you have Matt Reed as your director, who we've never seen tackle just like a straightforward action like that. We've seen him tackle like high concept sci-fi, or high, high concept horror with some action. We've never seen him do a full action movie like this. We've seen Paul Greengrass tackle movies in tense scenarios and with like really close quarters action. We know it could crush it. And yeah, I think if you want a you know only these action movies not going to get you know lost in the shuffle, you got to go with something like this. All right, excellent. Um, all right, so just to, just a heads up, um, I live on a I live on an island, uh, and the one of the only ways you can leave the island is to take a ferry, and that ferry's uh you know, it's 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 big, so you know people do take people people do take ferries. See? See, I was right. Exactly. Don't talk Plus, down my argument before I'm not, it happens. I am not talking down your argument, Senor. I am sim- I am simply stating a fact. Anyways, my point. My point is going to chance, and I will tell you, and I will tell you why. Uh, Cody had Cody had an incredible Cody had an incredible attack, uh, but it was actually Chance's defense that, uh, that that really sort of got it for me. Uh, Cody was really able to attack how yo the the ferry the ferry is too small. It's it's just sort of a communal thing as opposed as opposed to uh, opposed to a cruise ship, which I think he had a great idea of that having that being this isolated location where where they can really have the they can really raise the hostage stakes. Uh, but for me, it was sort of chance how he, he was able to defend it and be like, you know, a fairy can be claustrophobic. Uh, they, they, they can. Chance, chance gets the point. Uh, Ryan, based on the arguments provided, who gets your point and why? <clears throat> All right. Uh, both competitors delivered really good pitches. They really did. But for what put it over the top for me was uh, Cody's uh, pushback against chance by giving us like a. Uh, somewhat at a left field villain with J.K. Simmons. The fact that with a cruise ship, there's a lot more environment to play with, more so than a uh, ferry, which is probably considerably smaller than a cruise ship. So for me, I'm going to give the point to Cody because he's got a title. Uh, the director, Matt Reeves, killed it with the Last Apes movie. I think he could do a really good job on the film that he is pitching, more so than Paul Greengrass with Chance's film. So with that being said, I'm going to give the point to Cody for this one. Okay, so we are split up. Uh, Mr. Coho, uh, you are the tiebreaker. Based on the arguments you do get your point why. Um, Chance had a really good closing, um, but 
the rest of his argument leading up to that wasn't as strong as that closing, and I needed just a little bit more. Um, for me, it felt like Chance was always on the back foot countering Cody's attacks, and any counter he gave didn't resonate with me or land with me as strongly as Cody's attacks did. Um, so Cody sold me, uh, uh, sold me more in his pitch because he didn't really have to defend it all that much, where I didn't hear enough from Chance uh, because he had to spend more of his time defending Cody's attacks. So I'm going to give my point to Cody. All right, so Cody does strike first there. Uh, so we now move on to question number two. Uh, the question is the worst 2010s movie. Um, these picks are incredibly interesting. Uh, Cody, you're going to be going first. Uh, you have up to a minute, minute to two minutes. Uh, yeah, let's hear it. Okay, so um, the only reason I had to go this route is because of the motherfucker I'm battling tonight choosing something that's so out of left field. So I went with... I, sa- I said I would have changed it. I said I know. that I would have changed I, it. It's going to be a fun battle now. I'm doing Nine Lives. Oh, yeah. That's the kitty cat movie that uh, stars uh, Christopher Walken and uh, Creepo uh, Kevin Spacey. And I will leave it there. All right. Um, keeping it short and sweet. Chance. Uh, you have a certain amount of time. Uh, time begins. The name is the Okay, so, you know, I, I actually, I, I have a podcast where I get to review a lot of bad movies, so this uh, kind of helped me pick my choice, and I think my choice has to be, there's no other one I could have gone with than Kirk Cameron Saving Christmas. This is just a vehicle that Kirk Cameron did. I'm assuming he just spent money to film his house party so he can cash in on the rising trend of Christian movies making big money, and the world said, no, Kirk Cameron, you, we will not make a movie a success. This is one of the just biggest slogs I've ever had to get through in my entire life. There, there is not a single redeeming thing about this movie, and I will talk about it more in the, you know, in the uh, opening arguments or in the the, the free form. All right, cool. Uh, five minutes free form. Let's go. Well, I'm just gonna be real okay. quick with you. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, one of your Christian puff pieces as a person that goes to church regularly, this comes out every year. I'm not really worried about it, and I don't think. It's but like, there's there's not there's not one that's this offensively bad though. That that's uh, the thing. Like, and even by even by Christian movie standard, this is garbage. I will bet with you because if you've ever seen God's Not Dead two, that is the li- one of the worst sloshes I have ever seen in my life. It is about Jesus. I'm not I'm not saying room. God's Not Dead two is good. I'm just saying. I'm not saying God's not that good. See a bunch of Christians but that want God. to get Christ back in in Christmas versus um all these other movies about but Jesus not, takes on the courtroom. My problem is my getting, movie, it's not even getting. Sorry. Go ahead. It's not even get Christ back in Christmas. This movie is using Christmas to justify commercialism, and that is just absolute crap. One of the worst more ever seen. It's like Kirk wanted a PS4 for Christmas, but his super Christian parents wouldn't get him once and why Jesus said it's okay. The thing with Nine Lives, though, I will say, like, look, I saw Nine Lives in a theater, and it was the Suicide Squad. Yeah, I went in, I, I was hyped, I was ready to I was go in and just see the worst thing I saw that I was honestly disappointed. I was disappointed. Like, the movie's bad. It's not, but it's not like a get angry at the gods movie bad family film okay well i've let you have a conversation now it's my turn listen this movie is atrocious this movie came out way too late in life and it shows kevin spacey you're talking about kirk camera wanted a ps4 living kevin spacey apparently wanted to touch his core uh get a core vet from this movie or something 52 million dollars this thing made two million yours made so not enough people were affected by your movie and the main problem with Ke- this one movie now it has aged terribly because guess what now you have to watch it with a the voice but like that's but like that's the thing like if Ke- if kevin spacey if, Ke- if we didn't find out that kevin spacey was an awful human be as painful as it is this right is now still terrible. like that's the, the thing cgi like, is terrible no, the voiceover is gosh it awful. is Christopher Walken sells out yet again in another movie that you have to throw the Chris Walken voice in. Christopher Walken, at least Kevin fun Spacey in that didn't even want to be movie. movie. Like, at least movie. Movie. he's enjoying, he's enjoying himself. Your, I, your I didn't hear. Is, what was that? Your movie is your movie is just Woodlawn, uh, War Room, God's Not Dead Two, Noah. These thing. Christian movies no, here's the thing. Come out you wouldn't just, you wouldn't be saying that if you actually. I, I think I definitely watch it because this feels like this was Amazon shot. Amazon Prime. Yes, I like, did garage somewhere because 
Like at least not that. At least those feel like movies. This feels like it was shot like in like a garage. Like there is like no feel. Every, there is not a single good line read in this, this entire film. Every option sucks. It has you, to. It has to stall to meet an eighty-minute runtime, which is completely ridiculous. It's eighty minutes, and it still managed to be yeah. too long. So, so there is not minutes. a. 80 minutes. I but there, really but like, deal with... 80 minutes is not that bad of a runtime. That is very, that's very low key. I don't even have to turn it on for that long. And but Christmas trust me, when I it. feel every single one of those 80 minutes, like, yeah, it, like it may sound, may sound like easy breezy, but it's really not. The only reason people saw Nine Lives in this community was because of Dan Merle talking about it. The main factor is this movie is terrible. The voiceover works then. The CGI is terrible. There's no actual good plot points of this movie. Your movie's just another Christian puff, puff piece that comes out every year. This one was just shot on lower budget with the writing of Kirk Cameron. This one actually had Hollywood Studio behind it, and it still was shitty. The, the, the cat, you couldn't even convince me that was an actual cat. On screen, like, and he did not want to be a cat the entire time. Hollywood, Hollywood cranks out shitty movies all the time. Hollywood cranks out shitty movies all the time. It's not a surprise. Even, even though it doesn't have a major studio backing, look how many have major studio backing and some get a pass because of that major studio. And also, uh, yeah, at least like your, at least yours is shot like a movie. Yours has atmosphere. Yours feels like it wasn't shot like over. Like it has, like it's. One minute. It feels cinematic, sense, but it still feels, but it still feels that way. Kirk Cameron's just, it just really to like name a good thing about this movie that's not the running time. But I, I literally, Kirk Cameron. Uh, that's the whole thing. The whole point of this movie was not made for general public. This was made to sit on a life way. Oh, oh, really? You you say it wasn't made for general? You say it was not made for general public? You say then why did Kirk Cameron go on his Instagram page or how uh, people to upvote the movie so that more people could see it? He encouraged yes, people course, he wants to, to lie money. on That's Rotten Tomatoes the- because he wanted them to see, see more people because he wanted to make the new Christmas classic. But the whole problem with this entire movie was it was not actually made because the script over there just tells them about Christians the entire time. The problem, but like he, even even if, even as, even as Christian politics, he gets wrong. There's a whole story about Saint Nicholas that is just complete. If you even believe in Christianity, you know it's complete bullshit. Like e- like even. By Christian standard, this movie is crap. Like there is literally nothing good about this movie. As opposed right. to post yours, which I can say at least. Sorry, no, we're gonna stop. We're gonna stop there. Uh, we did hit the five minute mark there. Uh, we are gonna go into our closing arguments. Chance, you're gonna go first. Uh, you got about a minute uh, to wrap up your arguments and present it to the judges accordingly. Nine Lives feels like a movie. It's sh- it's shot it's shot nicely. The little girl who plays Kevin Spacey's daughter is trying. And so Jennifer Garner, bizarrely enough, like, like like I said, there is not a redeemable thing in the entirety of Kirk Cameron saving Christmas. The writing, directing, acting, all of it is just complete garbage. It's it makes it plays to an audience that even even they hated this film. Uh, like the it's Christian politics, it completely or it's Christian value, it gets completely wrong in the enti- in the entirety of the film. This was a movie that I know. I know it's small. I know it was made. It was made to cash in on a fad of successful Christian films, and even it failed at that. That shows you how bad this movie is. This movie is atrocious. It's one of it's one of if not the worst thing I've ever seen. And it's easily it, it used. It was at one point the high the number one movie on the IMDb bottom one hundred, and it completely deserved it. This movie is awful. Easily the worst movie of two thousand tens. All right. Uh, Cody, you were closing arguments. You got about a minute presented to the judges accordingly. Listen, Nine Lives for overall is just a movie that was actually released fully in theaters. Not saying that her cameras wasn't. It was it was limited at that point. But the whole thing is this was literally two actors that literally cashed in on a paycheck that they shouldn't have. Chance's movie is just like any other Christian movie I've sat in the theater and had to watch and literally then throw that the atheist is terrible and the Christian is good and we need to put Christian back in thing. So it's already been done and it's done a little better. They didn't even have to waste that much money on this movie. So it being a bad, terrible movie is not that bad. But Nine Lives actually actually made $56 million and people had to sit there. And the problem with now is Kevin Spacey is literally the voice of a cat, a child predator's voice of a cat, which is you can't even rewatch it anymore. Even if you thought it was watchable, you liked it. It's a terrible 
horrible message to send to the kids. And it's not even a kid's movie. This movie looks like it was shot out of a pet store. They, uh, they have no, they have no chemistry on screen whatsoever with any of these characters. Kevin Spacey has to bounce back and forth between the cat and the human. And guess what? You don't like him either time. And it's terrible. Um, Kirk Cameron's again, uh, this is God's not dead too. This is Woodlawn. This is all those Christian movies that puff you up and, they don't deliver anything at the end. So I, you don't lose anything by watching this. And my movie has a lower Metacritic score than uh, Kirk Cameron's Christmas with more reviews. All right. So um, interesting <coughs> arguments. Uh, yeah. Uh, go to go to Caleb Coho first. Uh, you were the tiebreaker last time. We'll go to you first so that your vote uh, is, not, is crucial. This was a really close argument. Uh, Chance picked the obvious film to go with, um, so Cody had to have so. <laughs> Cody had a hard time trying to fight against it, and uh, so Cody had to fight uphill the entire time. And he did a really good job of downplaying how terrible Chance's film was um, to the point where Chance just kind of kind of defended it, but didn't put enough effort into defending it on my end because he, he felt like Cody wasn't hitting him hard enough. But I feel like Cody's hits hit a little bit harder than Chance was anticipating. Um, Chance had a really good second half of his fight and a really solid closing um, to try and push back on Nine Lives. But I feel like Chance uh, just didn't do enough to Nine Lives and uh, didn't do enough necessarily to defend. I think Cody just fought a lot harder uh, and, made, and landed a few more good shots um, on... Saving Christmas, then she has it on nine lives. So I'm going to give it 51-49, Cody. All right. Uh, I'm going to go next. Uh, I'm going to just going to sort of cut. Yeah, just going to get my vote. Uh, bleh, bleh, get my vote out of the way early. Cody gets it. Um, he was able to hammer home a lot of, hammer home a lot of points. Uh, and, and just, I like, I think it was just more so Chance sort of just got eventually quartered into one point and then I, for me chances closing argument it just sort of sounded redundant just like i was imdb bottom 100 like easily one of the worst films of the decade just sort of like saying the same thing but just in a different way uh and i thought cody's closing was a, was a little bit better uh but yeah that does give cody the second point ryan your vote did not count but how would you have swayed yeah, this was a this was a battle. It was a great argument, but I'm definitely gonna have to give it to Cody on this one. The fact that this movie got made with the amount of talent that was in it is baffling to me because the trailer for it was just god awful. Kirk Cameron saving. I mean, I may have seen an ad for it in a paper somewhere and never thought about it ever again. So in this case, I would have given it to Cody because he just really like hammered in the points, like why th this film is so bad. Whereas Chance, I echo some of the same stuff that Caleb was saying, just kept a bit bit redundant with some of his points. But other than that. Yeah, I would have given it to Cody, man. I don't know how these big-time actors signed on for this piece of garbage. But, hey, I guess everyone needs a paycheck once in a while. So, All right. So, uh, Cody does get the second point there, going up uh, going up two to nothing. Uh, as we go into question number three, so a chance you do need to get this next question to, uh, to continue fighting. Uh, question number three, uh, the question was, uh, which is the best decade of comedy? Uh, chance, you are going to be going first in this one. Uh, you have a certain amount of time to uh, open up your arguments, and time begins whenever you start talking. Uh, shit, what did, what did I say again? Oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, so this was this was a really interesting question. There, there are a few answers in my mind that you can go with, but I decided to go with the seventies just because there are look. I mean, you can point to classic comedies and just about any decade that is of uh, the genesis of like new form of card with this whole like movement in the seventies. So, uh, so, so, so I'm going to go with seventies on the big, just legacy and just starting and, and just being able to start this whole of, of comedy. So I me going to inform. All right, uh, so Chance is going with 70s. Uh, Cody, you got a certain amount of time. Uh, you're okay, Arkansas, please. Okay, I don't normally do this, but this is literally what's going to happen. You want to talk about classics? Here we go. Airplane, Ghostbusters, Caddyshack, Back to the Future, Vacation, Ferris Bueller's, uh, Breakfast Club, uh, This is Spinal Tap, uh, for Fast Times and uh, – Fast Time at Richmond High, uh, 16 Candles, Coming to America, Trading Places, Big, Beetlejuice, Naked Guns, Stripes, Beverly Hills Cop, Blues Brothers, the original, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Space tri uh, Spaceballs, Captain, uh, Christmas Vacation, 48 Hours, The Goonies, Weird Science, Raising Arizona, Pee-wee's uh, 
Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Christmas Story, Princess Bride, Big and uh, Big Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Tootsie, When Harry Met Sally, literally Fletch, even and the original Police Kit Academies. Literally, this movie, this decade is not quantity over quality. This is quantity with quality. My my decade has by far the best movies. Your your decade is a very top heavy and once you get past it it's a bunch of pushovers that you don't find funny and you don't enjoy. But my movies have literally stood the test of times. They have literally been held in the highest regards of film of all time and it is the premier year of comedy. Uh, that is what I will say. <coughs> Alright, five minutes of free form guys. Uh once again, I will just give you a minute warning, but uh, but yeah, just keep going. So uh, let's get it on. Uh, so do I get a chance to list off every comedy from the nineteen eighties? I'll I'll do it. I'll do it for the seventies if, if if I get the chance. Uh, but look, I'm not I'm not saying I'm not saying that you know the eighties didn't have good comedy because it certainly it certainly didn't. The eighties was one that I that I did consider taking, but like look at how many. Look at how many '80s movies, '80s comedies we would not have if it wasn't for what, we, what started in originally in the '70s. Like you, you wouldn't have uh, Spaceballs without Blazing Saddles or Young Frankenstein. You wouldn't have uh, the National Lampoon movies without Animal House. Uh, you wouldn't have all these great satires from the '80s without the brilliant work of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I mean, you do, you do have quantity. I think I, I think I have the better crop of films to pick from. Oh, that is completely false, and you, you're even hard to say that. Literally, you want to talk The Return of the Pink Panther? Yeah, that came out your year. Listen, your movies are the problem. That's yours, that's funny. Is, listen, your biggest problem is that yours, a lot of your humor doesn't stand up today, especially Animal House and Blazing Saddles. A lot of those movies are not that crap. There are a lot of crass, and they're not that funny. The one is my, my comedic one goes through genres. We have action comedy. We have horror comedy. We have sci-fi comedy. We have comedy on comedy. We have everything in our exact thing, and it builds up strongly. You cannot say, I'm sorry, you may have the premier one that most people will say, and that's Holy Grail, but the main problem is Back to the Future and Ghostbusters literally are one of those movies that stand the test well, of time that has so many people. I mean, I, mean, I, can also point, I can also point to, you know, License to Drive or Ruthless People or After Hours in, in, your, in your decade. So, look, every, every decade has great comedies and bad comedies. So I think, I, I think it's a whole wash. I think you have to look at, you know, what what each one what each one started and what each one like draws from because like, I, I mean, look look at I mean look at my my decade. You have Mash, you have Silver Streak, you have Willy Wonka, you have the, you have High Anxiety, uh, Life of Brian, Bad News Bears, Muppet Movie. So you you do have a lot you do have a lot of great comedy. Really underselling the seventies as far as a decade. I'm not I'm not understanding the seventies. I think this I am not a fan of the argument that what they did for me lately or what it set up. Basically, the seventies set it up and the eighties knocked it out of the park. The eighties have literally the movies that people still goes back to and watch today. The seventies don't have those iconic one movies that people are like. Oh my gosh, they have the they have the very top heavy, but you have a lot of weak at the bottom. Mine has weak, of course, but we have thirty movies above it that you don't even have to get to because if you started a binge of the eighty comedies, you wouldn't even reach that for a while because you have so many great ones over and over. The hits don't keep coming. We have the physical comedy, we have the sci-fi comedy, we have we have laugh out quotable movies through and through. Your movies, I to be honest, the ones that I quote the most are Blazing Saddle, Young Frankenstein, and uh, Holy Grail. Those are the three that I'm find the most comedic and most funny. The rest. How, of how many? How many college campuses you can go by that quoting? Quote, quoting Toga, <laughs> Toga, Toga. Yeah, Toga and Toga is great and all, but th that movie is still very. You, you, you had the most. You had the most influential stoner watch. comedy. You had the most influential stoner comedy of all time, which you turned <laughs> up in smoke. You have oh, the most influential war watch. comedy of all time with Mash. Where's what? Car wash on your list. That was that was a great Richard. Car wash is funny. Was, I, I don't I don't oh, know please. what I don't know what you're what you're talking about. Car wash is funny. Oh, okay. Well, you're funny. Uh, the Apple Dumpling Gang. You want to talk about that one too? That one came out in your thing. Yeah, your guys was still on. Your still was on the. Your still was on the cusp of just somewhat humor and still had funny. Like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, great movie. But I don't find that as humorous. I like that's not mm. drop down comedy. That is more uh, spectacle. Spectacle. That's uh, music. That's that's good movie. But that's not like on the of comedy for me. The 80s have everything. We even have holiday comedies that still come up every every year because of the 80s. Because One minute. So can, I, can, I just throw, can I just throw it now? 
Can I just throw it now? Throw what? I'm, I mean, I'm, like, I'll be honest. I didn't have, I didn't have that. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to prepare because I was partying up in LA all weekend. So I honestly forgot we were doing this till today. That's fine. Right. So I'm cool with that. Uh, go, go, uh, I'll, I'll give it to him. Gotta get the points. Um. Okay. So your your yeah, winner by by forfeit slash knockout, I guess, because. While Chance is also conceding the points, he was on he was unable to he's unable to maintain the lead. So you are chance you're sure that you do want to concede this point? You, okay, is there is there a chance that I win this fight? There's no there's if you concede the point now, there's no chance you win this fight. But like if, if I keep is there, there you any need chance to, I, to argue Cody. I, I, I personally can't say that, but you do need to win this point if you are going to win this. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna win this point. Like there's, there's no fucking way I'm going to win this point. So, yeah, I'll throw it. All right. So, um, which means that uh, your winner by forfeit and knockout uh, is uh, Cody Newberry. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie, pretty shocked as, as to how uh, as to how this ended. Um, yeah, we're going to go do some uh, – we're going to do some pregame interviews. Um, Cody – or if you're free. Yeah. So Cody. So yeah, you, um, you know, you got two nothing and then chance just sort of conceded the points. You, I mean, obviously this will count as a knockout because, you know, we had to stop. We didn't go to speed round questions. How do you feel? Um, I mean, I don't like to win this way. Like, I would have liked it to just go to the end, and if I would have won, I think I won that last point. Um, so, like, but that's just again, I'm I'm sitting here, so I can't really. I don't know what you guys heard and what you guys took, but I mean, I'm excited. Uh, I I've said from the start of this little mini tournament that it doesn't matter about your record in debate. Uh, I just I feel like I am probably the strongest debater in this community, and Isaac. I'm ready for one hell of a match. Uh, I've seen you play. I respect your skills, but I think I have what it takes to take you down. All right. Well, um, I, I'm personally, not, I'm personally not sure who you're facing next, but the, the way the way that you're the way that you're talking, it sounds like you're facing Isaac next. Uh, so, um, so yeah. Uh, any other words for Isaac that you wanna you wanna say? Or? Um. You've held the title for a long time. You beat Evan DeGraff and freaking Greg. Those were nowhere near on my level of debate. So um, I know you don't like to share your answers before you deliver a match, but if that's still the case, that might be the worst mistake you make. Um, Because if you you do not prep against me, if you do not know what I'm throwing, I think it's going to be a long match for you. Um, And... Uh, again, appreciate Chance. Uh, this was a rough thing for him. Uh, I know he had the Smodown Awards. He was there. Uh, I heard on Collider Live they had a pretty fun after parties. So, like, I totally understand. We did. We, we, I, we, we did. I understand it was completely uh, – it was rough to uh, come in here and didn't even know what was happening. I get it. Um, but you still gave me one hell of a fight, I will say. I could have lost either one of those first two points. I would totally understand either way. Um, but, yeah. Um, I would love to debate Henry and Chance like in a ring that we could actually prep and get, you know, I think it would be a fun match. But, yeah, that's all I got to say. All right. So, um, Chance, you talk to me, man. What happened? Was it, was it the two points that you lost in question one or two that led you to this decision? Was this something that was – Yeah, like- pretty, pretty, pretty much. Strongest answers were the first two, and I lost those points. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna win the third one. I mean, like, I mean, like for, for me, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of perplexed because if you've been a champion in multi, you've been a champion in in, in a multiple in these in multiple leagues before you ever got called to the showdown. So my biggest thing is like, like just to go out with a go out with a bang. Like I, I understand the thing about like quitting while you're ahead, but like this isn't the chance that 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 I knew and and got to that I've gotten to know throughout this year. I'm, I'm, I'm personally surprised. Uh, you know, I'm. I have other. I have other things going on. I have other things to worry about. Uh, debating's fun. You know, I I wouldn't be opposed to stepping in the ring again. But uh, yeah, Cody. Cody's 
it's in a way that I'm I'm just not anymore. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of it's kind of like it's, it's it would be like my like Mike Tyson taking a long break, coming back and fighting the best fighter in the league. Like that's just like, it's 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 not it's not gonna be it's not, it's not gonna be a fair. Um, McGregor versus Khabib. Like that's not that's not a fair fight to come back to. So, uh, you know, uh, I respect the hell out of Cody. Dude, dude's a great debater, and uh, I think I put up a bigger fight against Isaac than I ever would. So, yeah. Uh, um. All right. Well, uh, unfortunate that things had to end this way, but you know, uh, life does find a way. Uh, I'm going to go to the judges now, though. Um, Ryan, uh, before. What happened happened. Uh, what, what were your thoughts on the match? Yeah, the match overall was was really good. These are two really great competitors. They're great debaters uh, for sure, definitely. Uh, Cody's just, man, he's like a thousand knives just coming at you. It's, it's, it's insane. And Cody the Cobra, uh, uh, the, the, the chance man, I mean, geez. I, I've seen some debates in my day, but this is, I've never, I never thought in a million years that it would be the Cobra conceding to uh you know the the loud mouse over here cody newberry but you know what it was still a good match they put up uh you know really really good efforts i wish chance all the best of luck in the future but this was uh it was cody's night man that last uh, argument there uh it was it was a pretty it was a pretty good argument from uh, both guys but i you know it's cody really <laughs> man did cody show up tonight he really did but chance all the best of luck in new york kick some tail take some names represent the uh commoners for us and uh we'll see you next time man yeah, that, right. that's the that's the other that's the other thing. Like, I I literally have so many. I'm not gonna I'm gonna sound like a dick, but I have other things I got to worry about. So uh, Cody can take the title fight. I don't need it. That's okay. All right, uh, Caleb, I'm gonna go to you. Uh, and I'll say ask the same same question I asked Ryan um, before. What happened happened. Uh, how we had what were your thoughts on the match? Um, overall, it was a good match. Chance put up a really good fight against Cody. Um, as someone who's been on the receiving ends of a debate with both these people, uh, they're both very tough competitors. Uh, Cody is a, a juggernaut when he gets into just throwing his barbs and throwing his, his punches. Um, and uh, when we got into that last fight, it was a slobber knocker between the, the two points that I had so far. Um, so to see it kind of end out that way was shocking. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't really have much to say about it. Uh, Cody won the fight and I think he's going to do a good job and, uh, I don't think chance should be done debating cause he did put up a good fight. It was just, it was just a really tough uh, competition today. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. I do. I do really sound, I'm do, I'm really surprised as to like, as just how this event turned, turned to earth this, how this went. I, I now mind you, I could be easily in the minority here. I sort of disagree with, with, I disagree with what chance did. I, I personally, in the belief of you should be, you should finish up, you should finish a fight, uh, blaze or the blaze of glory. Uh, that's my personal thought, but I think before that all happened, I think it was really good. They had some, they had some good back and forth, and, and I mean, obviously, in question one, I did think Chance, I think I did think Chance had had a, had a great argument there, but you know, obviously, I was in a minority there. Um, so before we get to uh, to some to some pregame wrap ups, I do believe the uh, the great champion himself, Isaac Horvat, has a few words uh, for uh, for Mister Newberry. So, uh, Isaac, the floor is yours if you'd like. Oh boy! Uh, well, congratulations. Uh, good match. I look forward to taking you on in the ring. I'm not going to talk too much crap because look, uh, it's been a while since I stepped into the ring. All I'm going to say is that it's been um, too long since I was here, and I understand it was production with all that, but uh, I feel like some people have forgotten who I am, and uh, I, I feel like I'm not going into this like it's defending my title. Like I feel like I'm fighting for this title again, just to remind people who I am. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. I look, I mean, you, you, you did what you did here. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it, man. Me too. I think you're really good. Um, it should be fun. It should be fun to prep out these questions. Again, I've never fought in a championship movie battleground match. You have that on me, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but I think I'll come out the winner, but we'll see. Well, you can think that. It's a good thought to have. Mm -hmm. Think positive, man. It's a good, good strategy. No, it's 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 paid off in every other league. So we'll uh, see you this one. 
All right. Uh, some passive aggressive blows uh, taken by both competitors. Uh, I do think this is going to be where we're going to wrap it up. Uh, I do want to thank the competitors and the judges uh, for, for hopping on today for this match. Uh, we'll start off with the winner, Cody Newberry. Cody, where can the cool kids of the world find you? I'm in Take Three Productions, where I help on three shows, watch alongs, returning with Robert, Malcolm, Matt, and myself. Uh, you can find me on Thursday, a late night with Take Three, also known as Brooklyn's Wrong, for two and a half hours. You can find me on Sundays on Rankum as the grumpy old man in the corner when it's actually stuff that I actually like to talk about, unlike dogs. Um, you can find me over on Multiplex. We run, uh, own, we run our own debate league over there. It's Nerdgasm. Me and Brooklyn, we have a tournament that's, by the time this comes out, some matches maybe should have dropped already. And you can pretty much find me all over the internet uh, talking trash and being an asshole. So, yep. All right. Uh, to our unfortunate loser today, Chance Ellison, where can the uh, cool kids of the world find you? Uh, not so unfortunate. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Chance Wars underscore 91. Find me doing work I actually get ready for and I actually love doing. Uh, check my, my, my podcasts, uh, Notorious by Chance, uh, PWCA, and Series Study, which we're going to be launching in 2019. Uh, three shows that I I love I love doing like they're I think they're all fantastic uh, and uh, yeah check out check out the Schmodown because uh, and uh, if you if you go to a live event in New York uh, talk, uh, say what's up to me you know it's gonna be, it's gonna be a fun time yeah. uh, to our first judge Ryan Permison where can the uh, cool kids of the world find you. Yes, sir. You can find me on Facebook at Ryan Permison. That's R-Y-A-N-P-E-R-M-I-S-O-N. Make sure you're following me on Twitter and Instagram at Ryan RPM5. And check out our YouTube channel, Nerd Culture. That's on YouTube at Nerd Culture. Make sure you're following us on Twitter and Instagram at It's Nerd Culture. We've got brand new videos coming your way very soon. And you can catch me competing in the various fan movie trivia leagues there. And hope to see you there. Thanks for having me. All right. And to our other judge today, the king, the kid, depending on what day you got him, Caleb Coho, where I can the cool kids in the world find you. Uh, you can find me on Multiplex Entertainment, where I host Fandom Fight on Fridays, and Jake Marangoni and I do an Oscar talk show called The Co-Hoskers. Uh, we'll be doing our first uh, video Co-Hosker ceremony, the fourth annual Co-Hoskers, in February, so check that out. We'll be giving out our own Oscars for what we think were the best films. Um, and yeah, that's basically where you can find me. All right, uh, and last but not, but not least, I'm the Black Lantern Brooklyn Bale. You can find me on Instagram at Tori. Did I miss something? Isaac. What you can, well, Isaac oh, please. Isaac, sorry. Isaac, the champion, you you grace us, you grace us with your presence, and we, I don't even let you plug. That's so exactly can, what I was talking about. Everybody's forgotten about me. <laughs> where can the uh, Isaac? Uh, uh, where can the cool kids of the world find you? <laughs> you can find me uh, at Gatker Gaming on Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, Instagram, all that stuff. Doing a lot of gaming videos, and on the Movie Underground live every Tuesday at eight o'clock on Twitch as well. Talking a bunch of movie stuff with my boy Mike, and here defending my title very soon cool uh and last but definitely not least i'm the black lantern brooklyn bell you can find me on instagram and twitter at the real bk10 the number not the word you can also find me right here uh on in the full metal verse uh jobbing to better people uh you can also find me multiplex entertainment running nerdgasm on saturdays like cody mentioned be sure to check out the uh, plethora of rama matches that have probably already gotten up also on big three productions i run not one but two shows jukebox trivia music trivia debate countdown be sure to check out jukebox trivia season three which will be dropping at the beginning of february uh and late night would take three returns on January 31st, our, our Super Bowl themed episode with a potential guest in the works. Uh, we'll announce that when everything is set in stone. So, for Chance, for Cody, for Isaac, for Matt, for Ryan, for Caleb, for myself, I am the Black Rider Rebel Bell. 